Chapter 1, Introduction to Modeling. In section 1.1, we're going to look at the topic of variables and constants. Variable. A variable is a symbol which represents a quantity that can change. Constant. A constant is a symbol which represents a specific number, a quantity that does not change. Let's take a look at an example to understand this a little better. A rectangle has an area of 24 square inches. Let W be the width in inches, L be the length in inches, and A be the area in square inches. Sketch three possible rectangles of area 24 square inches. So the first thing we might want to start off with here would be the formula. So for the area of a rectangle we have A equals L times W, or area equals length times width. So when we go to sketch this, we have to decide on our length and width, and we have to make sure that those multiply out to 24. So one possible way to do that would be 6 inches by 4 inches. So I'll draw that in. We don't have to measure here, we're just trying to get rough shapes and a decent picture. So I would say we have 6 inches by four inches and then if you multiplied that out six inches times four inches would give you the 24 square inches so that's one possibility another thing that we could do is three by eight so we could have something where we have three inches on one side and eight inches on another and we would still have that product of 3 inches times 8 inches giving us an area of 24 square inches. And then one other possibility would be 2 by 12. Kind of hard to do this on the same scale, I think, so I'm going to make this a little bit smaller in terms of its look. We have something maybe like this, where this would be 2 inches, this would be 12 inches, and when we do the product there, we still get that 12 times 2 is 24 square inches, so that's still working out. All right, so what they want us to understand from that is the idea that if you were given an area of 24 inches, 24 square inches, then that is constant through this problem. So um, all these pictures have that same value. But you can vary the length and the widths and still achieve that constant. So which of the three letters are variables? Well, we see different values here for our lengths and widths. So I would say the length and width are variables. So the length L and the width W, those are both variables. And which of the letters are constants? Well, in all three of our pictures, we had 24 square inches, 24 square inches, 24 square inches, and that was insisted upon in the wording, so I would say that the area A is a constant. All right, let's take a look at another example. In this one, they're introducing the variable T and saying they're going to let T be the number of years since the year 2009, and then they ask us a couple things about what T equals 5, what T equals negative 6 represent. These are very common situations to be in, in the application problems that we're going to do this semester. It's very common for them to start the clock at some given year, 2009, 2007, 2000, 1985, kind of whatever. But they will give us that starting point, and then we need to be able to figure out then, if we're starting in 2009 and T is five years since then, then what does that represent? So since that's a positive five, what you'd want to do is add that on and say 2009 plus 5 and so that would be the year 2014. This next one we don't do as often but it is possible that they would give us a negative value for t and if they say something like that then instead of adding we would subtract. So for t equals negative 6 we would still take that starting point of 2009 and then we would subtract 6 instead. So 2009 minus 6 would be the year 2003. And then finally, a little bit of graphing. And they want us to graph each of the following on the number line, negative 4, 7 thirds, 
and 5.7. And when you go to graph things on a number line, really all you're doing is plotting a dot in the position that corresponds to that number. So we'd start off by numbering our number line. We have both negatives and positives here, so I'm going to go ahead and put 0 in the middle. And then we have to pick a scale, and the default thing that we would think is go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And as long as that will fit the numbers, that would be okay. And so if we do that, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 5.7 would fit on our graph, so that would be fine. And then our smallest number is negative 4. And if we were doing that numbering in ones, negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 would uh, fit that negative 4 as well. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5, negative 6, negative 7. And it is the standard in math that we would, on a horizontal number line, do our positives to the right and the negatives to the left. You might also notice it's a little crowded looking over here. Um, because of that, I often won't number every single notch, so you'll see in future examples where I might number every other one instead. All right, so let's go ahead and plot these points. So negative 4, you start at that 0 and you count 4 to the left, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then you would just plot a dot there, make it nice and big, easy to see, and that's how you would graph that point. When you go to do 7 thirds, that's a little different because of the fractional notation. It can be a little trickier to figure out where that's going to be on our graph. And so one common thing to do to make that a little easier is to switch that to a mixed number. So if you take that 7 thirds and think about 3 going into 7, 3 would go into 7 twice, which would be 6, so there'd be 1 left over. So this would be 2 and 1 third. So when you go to graph that, you want to go to 2 and a third of the way to the next notch. And so when you think about that third, just kind of imagine, we didn't usually wouldn't mark this, but just kind of think one, two, three, that we're kind of breaking that up into three spots and go over to two and then one of those thirds over as well. So typically I wouldn't notch that out. I would just do the best I could to get that roughly in the right spot. And so mainly I'd be thinking a third is a little less than halfway across. So over to two and then about a third of the way across to the next one. And then 5.7 is similar. We want to go to 5 and then a little more than halfway to 6 because 0.7 is more than half. So over to 5 and a little bit more than halfway to 6. So maybe somewhere right around there would be our 5.7. And again, just good, solid, easy to see dots. Not a tiny little kind of tap, but a nice round circle that's easy for people to read. Okay, moving on to page 2. Let's look at an example. Consider the following set of numbers, negative 4, 7 thirds, 5.7, 0, pi, the square root of 13, 3, and negative 7.9. List the counting numbers. So let's define that before we start listing. The counting numbers is also referred to as the set of natural numbers, and that's actually a more common name for that in math. And it would be the list of numbers you would think of if you were counting up items. So 1, 2, 3, etc. And if we look back up at our list, the counting numbers, uh, the only counting number that I see is the number 3. And then the counting numbers, or more commonly natural numbers, are listed with a capital N. And to make that N stand out from other Ns, what they do in a textbook or online is they show it as a bold N. When you're handwriting it, what we normally do is draw kind of an extra line on that first vertical bar. All right, next they want us to list the integers. When you're doing the integers, you have all of your counting numbers. So you've got 1, 2, 3, and so on. You've also got 0 in this list. And then you've also got all the negatives of your counting numbers. So negative 1, negative 2, negative 3 and so on. So that's your set of integers. For integers they use a capital Z and again I'll draw that extra line there to make it look like a special Z not just any old variable Z. And when we look up at our list what we've got in there is the the 0 now would be counted, the 3 is still counted and now we'd also do the negative 4 as well and I'll do those in order. 
So negative 4, 0, and 3. And that's our integers. And next they want the list of rational numbers. And it starts to get a little bit trickier here, including with the definition. So I'll spend a little time with that. For the rational numbers, you have ratios. So A over B, that's where we get the word rational, is that it's a ratio. We would normally just look at that and think of it as a fraction. And they are ratios or fractions such that the numerator A and the denominator B are both elements of the set of integers, capital Z. But when you're making a fraction, you're also doing a division problem, A divided by B. And when you have fractions or divisions, you're not supposed to divide by 0. So that B there cannot be 0. And also, when you think of a fraction as a division, the answer to a division problem is referred to as the quotient. And we use that word to get our label here. So for the rational numbers, we actually use a capital Q that comes from that quotient. And we draw this little extra vertical line here to make that look special as well. So the set of rational numbers is the set of all fractions of the form a over b such that the numerator a and the denominator b are both elements of the set of integers but the denominator b cannot be equal to zero there's a little bit of notation here that we should go ahead and get used to this vertical line right there is read as such that and then this little symbol right there we read as is an element of. So all we're really saying there with that last symbol, with that kind of E looking symbol, is that A and B are in that set of integers. All right, let's get back and look at our list now and think about which ones are rational numbers. So it may not be obvious at first, but all of our integers are going to fall into that set of rational numbers because you could write any one of those as um, over 1. Like, for example, negative 4 is negative 4 over 1. So now I've expressed that as the ratio of two integers. So even if it's not written initially as the ratio of two integers, if it can be, if it's possible to do that, then it's still rational. So we can do that with all of our integers, so they all make the list of rationals. So negative 4, 0, and 3. But there's other numbers in that list that are going to fall into that set too. The 7 thirds, I think, fairly naturally fits in there. It's an integer over an integer, so we'd list that one. And then we have one, actually two more, that are a little bit tricky. The 5.7, let's write that right here could also be said as 5 and 7 tenths, and it could also be written as 5 and 7 tenths, which is a mixed number, but we can do 5 times 10 is 50, plus that 7, and write that as 57 over 10, and now all of a sudden it has been expressed as one integer over another one, or the fraction of two integers, so apparently 5.7 is also a rational number. So I'll add that in here. And then that's also going to be true of our other decimal, negative 7.9. It turns out, though it's a little complicated to prove, and I won't do that here, that the numbers pi and square root of 13 are not rational. Uh, any number that's in a square root, if you can take the square root and get something nice, like for example the square root of 25 is 5, then you could say that the square root of 25 is rational. But if you have something like the square root of 13 where you get this messy decimal answer of 3 point something 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 that just goes on and on without repeating a pattern, that's going to be irrational. The rule for looking at a decimal and knowing if it's rational or not, or not is if like these two it terminates, it's definitely rational. Another way you can get a rational is if it's a repeating decimal. So for example, squeeze that in down here, one third would be 0.333 repeating, and clearly that's rational, 1 over 3, and yet it has a decimal that goes on and on and on forever with those threes just going and going and going. All right, so the irrational numbers apparently would be the ones that are not rational, so that'd be our pi and our square root of 13, so I'll go ahead and complete the question. And then let's go down here and define the irrational numbers and the real numbers. So irrational numbers are any numbers on the line that are not rational. 
And then the set of real numbers is taking the rational numbers and the irrational numbers and putting them all together. And that makes up all the numbers that are on a number line. For the real numbers, we use a capital R and again an extra line on the left vertical bar to kind of designate that as a special R, not just any old R. And then here's a picture of what we saw in this example. All of our counting numbers were integers, so we show the counting numbers being inside of that set of integers. And then every integer turned out to be a rational number, so we show that set of integers as being inside of the set of rational numbers. And then the irrational numbers are separate. So you've got your rational numbers and your irrational numbers, and they have nothing in common. Uh, there's no overlap between those two. But when you put them all together, the rationals together with the irrationals, then you have all the numbers that are on the number line, or all of the real numbers. Okay, moving on to page three. We're going to define the average. To find the average, or mean, so the first thing to say there is another word for the average is the word mean. And in fact, in a math class or a statistics class, we would say it's more proper to use the word mean than average. So to find the average or mean of a group of numbers, we divide the sum of the numbers by the number of numbers in the group. Or in other words, we add up all the numbers and then divide by how many numbers we had. Let's look at a quick example. The annual profits and losses for various years for a company were a loss of $2 million, a profit of $4 million, and a profit of $9 million. Let P be the company's annual profit in millions. Find the mean profit over these three years and round to the nearest tenth of a million dollars. So if they want us to find the mean, which is the average, then we're going to want to add these numbers up. But we do have to pay attention to the wording here because the first number is a loss of $2 million. So I would represent that as a negative 2. And then we get a profit of $4 million. So I can say add 4. And then another profit of $9 million. So that's plus 9. And then I would divide this by 3 since we have 3 numbers that we're adding together. And then we should also note here that it's not really a negative 2, it's negative $2 million. So we have to make sure that we do express that in our final answer. But to list all those zeros of the words here, I think, would get in the way of the math a little. So doing the math, we have 4 plus 9 is 13. And then you subtract those $2 million they lost in their first year. And you have 13 minus 2 would be 11. So we could say that our average is 11 thirds. But they want us to round that to the nearest tenth of a million dollars. So at that point, we would switch over to the calculator. And I'm just going to go ahead and enter that in. So 11 divided by 3. And I get 3.666 repeating. And then they're asking us to round this to the nearest tenth of a million. So this would be 3 million and then 0.6. So that's our tenth spot. And even though that's a 6, we have to look at the next digit, which is also a 6, and therefore round that up to a 7. So I'm going to say this is approximately 3.7. And because I did round that, I put this approximately equal sign to make people aware of that. And then I just want to make sure I get the proper units on that for my answer. So I would say that that is $3.7 million. And I already have the dollar sign out front, so I don't need to write that in words. So that's basically it. Um, there are times when I see people working this and they want to write P equals out front. Now that actually would be incorrect because P is the profit in any given year. They defined that for us right here. Let P be the company's annual profit. But that's an annual profit, so that's each year. If you do the average, what you're actually getting is the average profit. And if we were going to do a notation for that, we'd do a P with a line over it, which we would read as P bar. When we do averages in statistics, it's very common to talk about X bar, where we're getting the average of our x values. Alright, that's it for section 1.1.